The lines between what's acceptable and what's not are blurred. We look at society as a whole and we wonder about what in the world's going on. I'm not much older than many people in here, but younger than most. <laughs> and I remember a time that things that are going on right now would have never been heard of. Those who are even older than I can't even imagine the stuff that I faced. So now I look at what these young children are facing. I look at what teens are facing, what our college students are facing. It absolutely boggles our mind about where we're at. Well, true to form, all of that turmoil, all of that not knowing has permeated its way into even the religious world. So now we come up with a very convoluted way as a society of who God is and what he wants for us. Tonight we're going to be looking at some of that. As many of you know, this week starts the Ministering to Youth Conference. Some 48 different classes and keynotes from people who are, have been doing youth and family ministry far longer than even I've been alive. We're going to gather together and we're going to talk about these issues. The issues I'm talking about tonight will be discussed at great length this week. But not just this, but about all the issues that our kids and that our families and that our congregations are facing. And it's all, it all stems from this modern world view of who God is and what God wants for me. In a recent study, and I'm going to be talking about several of these things amongst members of the church, that's the scary part, is that a lot of this is members of the church. External factors in their lives determine a lot of their views on who God is. It becomes situational ethics, if you would. That's a, where, well, what, well, maybe if I'm really hungry and I really need this to, to eat something, it's okay to steal it because I'm hungry. That's situational ethics. You can rationalize that I'm hungry, you have food, I can steal your food and I'm okay. Situational ethics, the problem with that is that it's always on a curve. Because again, we're changing so much because what's good for you might not be good for someone here. So you end up with something very different, but both of you are going to claim to be right in whatever decision it is that you make. Self is the center of the belief. It's based on what you know and how you feel. More importantly of those two is how you feel. We're going to be talking about that in a few minutes. So you start to see that if situational ethics, how you feel starts to determine what your view of God is, God becomes a very different person than what we read about in the Bible. In fact, I would submit, God's no longer the God of the Bible, and you've turned yourself into that God. This idea is called moralistic therapeutic deism. If it makes me feel good. The basic content of this is I, I want to do good. I want to feel good about myself. And that's pretty much why God exists. That's the general scope of belief of many young people in the church. Not just the Church of Christ, but this then extends in the next step to every religious group that's out there. 
And we're going to talk about that. The belief system of this moralistic therapeutic deism is this. Number one, a God exists who created and orders the world and watches over it. Believers, and I use that in quotation, are split on the being, on this being, the God of the Bible, or one who created the world, got it going, and then stepped away. They want to jump out there and say, yeah, it was God created everything, but he's not there now. He just got the top going. Commonly called theistic evolution. That there is a God. Yes, I believe there's a God. He created the world. Yep, he got it spinning and then he stepped away and everything that happened, that lends room for all the evolutionist theories to come in. Number two, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other as taught in the Bible and most world religions. This is theistic equivalence. Because then if we buy into that, that that's all that God wants us to do is be good, nice, and fair to each other, then we're good. Well, I think the Bible teaches us to do that. There's no doubt. Islam teaches us to do that. Buddhism teaches us to do that. Hinduism teaches us to do that. Well, now if they're all teaching the same thing in our mind, then they're all the same. And one's just as good as another. We can go out, and there may even be people in this audience tonight that believe that. That because we teach those generic principles, that one's just as good as another. It doesn't matter what the sign on the front of the building says. If it's a church, we're good to go. Just this afternoon, a friend of mine posted on Facebook. He's a, he's a, a Methodist minister. He's excited. I've got good news. He's been retired, by the way, from Methodist ministry for, for several years. Good news. I've now taken the position as the minister at the County Christian Church. You jump from being this religion preacher to here with no transition in the middle. Theistic equivalency. One's just as good as another. God didn't set it up like that. God is not involved, number three in this, God is not involved in my life except when I need God to resolve a problem or I need something. Our society looks as God at God as though he's some magic genie up in the sky. Life's good, life's good, life's good. I got trouble. God, I need your help. Life's good, life's good, life's good. God, you there again? And in between times, we don't give any thought to God. And first of all, I'm here to submit that God's there all the time. And he wants to hear from us. He wants to hear the good. He wants to know our concerns. He wants to know what we're worried about. He wants to know what our cares. He wants him to be, to, to, uh, for us to thank him. He wants us to come to him. But he's not a vending machine. You don't pop the prayer in, hit the button, and get what comes out. Thank you. See you next time. So he's just there as a safety net. Well, that's not the God of the Bible. Two more points, but this one 
is the crux of the whole matter. I mentioned it earlier. In their belief, the greatest majority, quote unquote, of believers is this. The central goal in life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Well, that's a wonderful statement. It's a wonderful sentiment. God wants me to be happy. As long as I'm happy, God's happy. Well, there's a huge problem with that. God doesn't care about your happiness. He cares about your holiness. And what makes you happy might not make me happy. So if what makes you happy is not in accordance to God's word, God's not going to be happy. God's not up there just blessing everybody for anything and everything that they do. There is sin in this world. There are things in this world that God does not approve of. We may think they're grand. We may think this is great. I want to be a part of that. That's fun. All my friends are doing it. I'm going to do that. God, I'm happy. I hope you're happy. It's not the way God works. But as long as we're happy, now I'm going to tell you this. That's not to say that we're supposed to be sad. But our joy doesn't come from externals. The God of the Bible has said that our joy comes from an internal. My joy is knowing that if I drop dead right now, I get an eternity in heaven with God. That's what I've got to be happy about. I'm happy that I've got brothers and sisters in Christ here that I can go to in a time of trouble that I can lay my heart out to you and say, guys, I need your help. What do you think about this? Can I get you to do this? Can we do this together? Can you pray for me? That brings me peace that I've got a family here that'll watch out for my soul. Because see, if there's things that make us happy, and externals that make us happy, it becomes about me. Would I like a bigger house? Would I like a bigger car? Would I like more money in the bank account? Would I like to do whatever I want to do? Well, the common factor in all that is what I want. And if it's what I want is what makes me happier, then that's not the right thing that God wants. God could care less about your house. He'd care less about your car. He wants to know, have you invited somebody over to dinner at your house? Have you given a ride to somebody in your car? Did you share the money in your bank with somebody that needed it? That's what God's concerned about. Lastly, good people go to heaven when they die. We're all sitting in here right now and we know somebody that we could call by name who believes that all good people go to heaven. If you do good on this earth, you go to heaven. Great sentiment. We should do good. We should be happy towards people. We should open their, uh, open, uh, welcome them with open arms. But just because you're good doesn't mean we go to heaven. In fact, the Bible tells us just the opposite. Because there's going to be many people on that day and say, Lord, Lord, have we not done many wonderful things in your name? And he's going to say, depart, I know you're not. For our parents, we can stem the tide of this with the next generation of kids. Kids will mirror what they see. Kids will mirror what you do. 
What's the country song about we're driving down the road and they slam on the brakes and his Happy Meal goes sailing and he says a word to the little kid. He said, where'd you hear it? From you, Dad. Kids are going to hear this. They're going to mimic what they see, what they hear. As I talked about this morning, where's your priorities? Is your priority in showing your kids what is important? Or is it in what makes them happy? Is it steering them socially so that they're in the right club? Is it make sure they're hanging out with those people? Oh, that's the in crowd at school. We got to make sure that they're there. We got to make sure they're on that sports team. That's the better sports team. We don't care that they practice on Wednesday nights as long as they're on that team and they're happy. What are your kids hearing from you? And I'm not talking about just verbally. What are they seeing from you? Kids see your priorities. Why do you think God spent so much time in the Bible talking about our example? As parents, we have one job. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's our responsibility as parents. Not just to make sure that little Billy's happy. Not to make sure that Miss Sally's just in the right place. We need to be concerned about their souls. See, we spend the early years of development teaching them what to do. You should share your toys with your friends. Share your crayons and all that stuff. That's a good thing to do. And we spend all the time talking about what they should do. And, no, and then when they get a little bit older, then we start all the don'ts. Don't drink. Don't drive. Don't have premarital sex. Don't do this. Don't do that. What's all that got to do with a relationship with Christ? We talk about the rules, but we don't talk about discipleship. Have we talked about God in a way that those kids are going to grow up wanting to have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Oh, we can give them book, chapter, and verse, but that's book, chapter, and verse. I know a God that loves me. I know a God that wants the best for me. He's given me the plan to do it. Follow this and you'll be all right. Do this is what will please me, God, not me, Brian. That's our responsibility. And we're so flippant about it. Uh, in my office, I meant to bring it out here to show this. You know the blue bags that we have in the back? Kids color on them. There's Bible lessons and stuff like that that are on those. Well, in the afternoons, we take out the ones that are used and we put in new ones and all that kind of stuff. There's one that's in my desk that I keep it there and is a reminder of this very point. Obviously written by some little kid, because, and I don't know who, there's no name on it. They colored in the fruits of the Spirit that were on the sheet. And on the back, the little kid, this must have been on a Sunday morning, the little kid wrote, Mommy, can we come back here tonight and put two little boxes, check yes or no? Why did that kid have to ask that question? That's the part that makes me sad. I'm not perfect. Carol and I have screwed up. But I never recall a time when our kids said, are we going to church tonight? Are we going to church on Wednesday night? They knew where we were going to be. They didn't have to fill out a little paper that says, can we come back tonight? Parents, let that soak in. We should frame that little piece of paper and hang it up on a wall out here. Because whoever that little kid was, you've taught a Bible lesson that's beyond anything that I can do.
We should want our kids. We should want our families to have a relationship with God. Not just think of him as some being that's out there floating around watching over us. Now I'm going to read a passage of Bible that's going to explain all of this. If you turn in your Bibles over to Colossians, the first chapter, we're going to start in verse number 13. We're going to wrap it up with this because of all of that stuff that I talked about. Moralistic therapeutic deism, deism equivalency, God wants me to be happy. God's just this floating around being kind of a vending machine, pop the prayer in, hit the button and get what I want. See you next time, God. Paul's writing here makes it perfectly clear who God is, who Jesus is, and how we have a relationship with him. Starting in verse 13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed unto us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. First point. There is darkness. It's not just all the same thing. But God in his infinite wisdom through Jesus Christ has delivered us from that darkness. He's made that available to us in the kingdom. Wow, we can get into a kingdom? We should feel special when we're in a kingdom. Especially if we're invited in and it was provided for us. When I lived in Central America, my best friend, his uncle was the ambassador from Panama to the United States. And when we would go into the city, we'd go to the embassy and we'd go to his uncle's compound for the sake of a better word. Now, I'm going to tell you, it's pretty cool when you walk up to the door and the folks are standing there with their machine guns and the gate's locked and they got the barbed wire thing going across the gate. And you tell them who you are and they say, oh, come on in. That's pretty cool. And when you get inside, you realize I'm pretty safe. Why don't we feel the same way about God's kingdom? He's opened the gates through Jesus Christ. Come on in. And there's safety inside. Well, how do we get in there in whom we have redemption through his blood? Oh, so now there's something that we do to be redeemed to get into that kingdom. It's when we come in contact with his blood, Jesus' blood. Absolutely. Absolutely. You see where this starts tearing away at the thoughts that we just came up with about our modern view of God. And we continue. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him And for him. Does that sound like somebody that just got the thing started and then stepped back and said, go? To me, that sounds like he's pretty involved with everything that's going on. That's the God I'm reading about in the Bible. He doesn't take a hands off approach. What part of that list are we not? Do we not deal with daily? Are we not a part of all of that stuff? What was created by him. And he's there in it, active in it. 
And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And he is the head of the body, the church. Not group A, group B, group C. The singular church. Jesus is the head of it. So it doesn't matter as much as we say, oh, attend the church of your choice. Well, yes, you're free to do that in our country. But there's only one church that's the choice of God. And he wants you there in his kingdom. For it pleased the Father, in verse number 19, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness shall dwell and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on the earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Everything that's going to be reconciled to God is going to come through Jesus, through his blood. Well, now that tells me something else. When Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father but by me, that makes a whole lot of sense what's going on right here. Again, it doesn't go back to church A, B, C, or D. It doesn't matter if you're happy. This is what God wants. Verse number 21. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body, the church of his flesh, through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. You who were bad. How many of us in this room fit into that category? Oh good, everyone's hands up. Every single person in here, before they were baptized for the remission of their sins, fits that category. You are enemies. Let that soak in of God. <clears throat> in case you haven't read the whole Bible, I'm going to give you the cliff note version right now. In the end, God wins. The end. You get to pick a side. You're going to be an enemy of the guy that wins, or are you going to be on his team? Verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, for which I, Paul, became a minister. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded in steadfast and are not moved from what you've heard, which I, Paul, have preached to you. That, those, those 10 verses we just read dispel every concept of the modern worldview of God. Now, let's dovetail this into this morning's lesson. What are we going to do with that information? Because you see, the world sees God like I just explained. He wants me to be happy. He doesn't care where I go to church. If I go to church, I can be my own church. As long as I'm good, I go to heaven. If I'm happy, he's happy. We all know people who think like that. Sad to say. But yet, we've got a book that can dispel all of that 
and teach them that there is a God that loves them. He is a God who has a plan. He's a God who has a pattern for us to follow after. He is a God who has given us all the instructions. We don't have to figure it out for ourselves. Those people that each of us know that think that way, let's go give them the alternative. We've got the good news. The world's upside down. Now I think more than ever, this country and this world needs the God of the Bible. Are we going to sit on our hands or are we going to go deliver the good news? And as we said this morning, spread the good tidings of the kingdom to every city and every village just as Jesus did and dispel all the badness that has permeated our religious belief. Tonight, we're going to sing a song. We're going to encourage you to come down here and if you have anything that's weighing on your heart, you want the prayers, you want the help, you want to seek guidance, you want comfort from the congregation, we welcome you to come. Let us talk to you. Let us pray with you. Let us study with you. It's not that you're coming for, for Brian. It has nothing to do with me. This is where your heart is made right with God. Through prayer of the assembled family. And there's nothing that can be better than that to offering peace. There may be some in here who, for some reason or another, have just, they've, they've decided that I'm, I'm, I'm outside of that and I want that peace. How, how do I get to be a part of that kingdom? Hearing the word, believing the word, Confessing that Jesus is the Son of God. Repenting of your sins, knowing that indeed you are a sinner and that I cannot go to heaven on my own. That through the blood of Christ, who died for me, I have a gateway to his Father in heaven. And then coming in contact with that blood in the watery grave of baptism. Wash away your sins. And then start that journey, not like the world sees God, but as the Bible sees God. Start that journey tonight. If you have any need, won't you come as we stand and sing?